Today we're going to restore the power assist brakes on our K-swapped diesel Honda Insight. Of course in our case, the K stands for Kubota. And since this little diesel engine doesn't develop any vacuum, well, the power assist brakes don't work. And it takes a little bit of effort to slow this beast down. Also, later in the video when we do a road test, we'll give you folks some updates on the cooling system modifications we did in the previous video. Alright, let's get started. In order to restore the power assist brakes on this Honda, we're going to be using a low cost 12 volt rotary vane vacuum pump. And because we're lazy, we'll also take advantage of a low cost CNC cut bracket that's available for this pump. This bracket comes in handy if fabrication's not your thing. To control the pump, we're going to be using a low cost vacuum switch and this switch will keep the pump from running all the time and that should keep the annoying sound of the pump to a minimum and it also should make the pump last a long time. Now unfortunately this light duty switch won't directly drive the vacuum pump so we're going to have to use a 30 amp relay between the switch and the pump. And finally we're going to need to use a check valve because all these parts are somewhat sketchy and it's hard to say if we actually need this part but we're going to use it anyway. Let's take a better look at all this stuff on the bench. So here is the rotary vane vacuum pump. I believe this pump is used on some Volvos and possibly the Chevy Camaro and perhaps a bunch of other cars. It ran 56 bucks on the jungle site and the quality is always suspect when you buy from the jungle site. But this one actually seems like a good value. Now future Jimbo says it works fine so it's got at least one positive vote. The electrical connector appears decent but we ain't going to be using it and that's a shame. Now keep in mind, I completely fabricated everything on the diesel powered Honda Insight and today we're going to take a shortcut and use the stainless steel CNC cut bracket. I think I gave 17 bucks for this on, you guessed it, the jungle site. Now I'm not affiliated with the jungle site in any way, but apparently if I don't mention where I got stuff, it upsets people. So just a heads up, everything we're going to be fooling with today is from the jungle site, but you can get this stuff anywhere. Meh, the bracket comes with these crappy fasteners to mount the pump. I ended up using something a bit more robust. In order to control the brake booster pump, we're going to be using this vacuum switch. And I think I gave 23 bucks for it. This is actually a ground switch. And what that means is when the switch is activated, it connects this terminal to the body of the switch. So long story short, this switch needs to be bolted to something on the car that's grounded. If you don't, well, it won't work. Now the other thing about this switch is, it can't carry a heavy current and that means you can't directly connect this to the vacuum pump. Nope, instead this switch has to be used to trigger a relay and the relay will pass the current to the vacuum pump. Now if electrical is not your thing, don't worry, I'll post a wire diagram on how all this connects later in the video. And of course this is the relay we're going to be using. I think this one's rated for 20 or 30 amps, it should be fine. Now the last thing we have to look at is this check valve and I'm not sure it's necessary. You see I've read that the vacuum pump actually has a check valve and I'm not sure I believe that. And future Jimbo agrees with me. Something is sketchy about some of this stuff and this valve will make things just a bit less sketchy. Okay so we're almost ready to start playing with this stuff but future Jimbo wants to say a few words so have at it Jimbo. Thanks Jimbo. Well, the first thing I wanted to mention is the pump draws 5.5 amps when it's running and we did see a surge at startup that was close to 12 amps. Nothing unusual there, just a heads up for those thinking about a similar project. Alright, with the pump running, it'll develop a vacuum close to 25 inches of mercury. Now, unfortunately for the metric crowd, you're going to have to do your own calculations. But here's a quick cheat so you can follow along without doing the math. A diesel engine doesn't develop any vacuum and that's because they don't have a butterfly type throttle. However, on a normal gasoline car, the engine will develop a vacuum between 17 and 20 inches of mercury at idle. And the vacuum can surge up to 25 if you're driving along and lift your foot from the accelerator and allow the car to coast. Now, the other Jimbo mentioned the word sketchy a few times already, and let me double down on that. This vacuum gauge, well, it's sketchy, and close enough is the other word of the day. Actually, that's two words, but you get the idea. Ah, you nitpickers and the keyboard warriors. This is the way it's done in the real world. You guys need to go out in the garage and discover the world ain't perfect. Anyway, this rotary vacuum pump develops vacuum pretty quick, but it ain't instant, so there is some lag time. 
Now, one more thing, even though the pump can develop close to 25 inches of mercury, the inline vacuum switch that we chose shuts the pump down at about 15 inches of mercury. And if you recall a few moments ago, I mentioned that a normal gasoline engine develops between 17 and 20 inches of mercury. So the pump is fine, but the switch is kind of falling short. Now, keep in mind, this switch is not adjustable. You see, the manufacturer has glued the adjustment thingy in place, and it is what it is. We potentially have a solution for this minor issue, but before we spend more money, let's see how it works first. It might be fine just the way it is. All right, let's jump right into this. Now, I have no use for this connector because I plan on wiring this motor differently, so off it goes. For bench testing, I'm going to be using these Wago type connectors, and this is just for convenience. These are great for quick and temporary connections when testing stuff. So the first thing I want to check is, does this pump actually have a check valve? If it does, then it should be able to hold a vacuum. And no, it would appear the pump doesn't have a check valve or the valve is sketchy. Also note that the vacuum gauge is not zeroed out and that's my bad, I should have checked that. Now since we have everything set up, let's make sure the check valve that we purchased actually works. You know, nowadays, just because something is brand new doesn't mean it's going to work. You pretty much have to validate the operation of a lot of stuff right out of the box. And it helps preserve your sanity later on when nothing's working. I think we've all been there at least once or twice. Now there was a little arrow on the check valve, and that should point towards the pump in case you're wondering. All right, let's get the pump some juice and see if we can hold a vacuum. And sure enough, it does. Now off camera, I watched this gauge and the check valve holds a vacuum a lot longer than I'm willing to wait. So that's good news. I think the basic stuff seems to work fine. And the next step would be to test this cutout switch. But for that, we would need the wire in the relay. I think we're gonna skip that for now and do a little testing on the car to make sure that the vacuum booster on the Honda still works. It's been a few years since it was last tested. Now, a quick backstory on this car. You see, we saved this car from the scrapyard a few years ago, and just for fun, we took the original engine out and installed the $99 212cc Harbor Freight engine. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it was just for fun. Anyway, with the tiny 212cc engine, there was no way the vacuum booster for the power assist brakes was ever gonna work, so we drove the car without power assist brakes. It takes significantly more effort to apply the brakes without the power assist, but on this car, it ain't that bad. Anyway, after having a lot of fun modifying the 212cc engine for more power, we decided to upgrade to a 420cc engine. Things got out of hand, and we ended up with a fuel-injected supercharged intercooled monstrosity that was slower than a moped off the line, but given enough time and road, the car was able to get up to 70 miles per hour. Of course, at that point, we still didn't have power assist brakes. Fast forward a few years, and now this car is sporting a 719cc soon-to-be supercharged Kubota diesel engine. And it's time we got the power assist brakes working. It's not a safety issue per se. Nope. The reason we want the power assist brakes to work is to allow different drivers to be able to handle the car. And power assist brakes are actually nice to have. So this is the booster for the power assist brakes on this Honda. Now, this booster is similar in design to millions of other cars on the road, and other than being on the smallest side, it's nothing special. Here, let's take a look at a cartoon so you can get a better idea of what's going on. Real quick, this is the brake pedal and this is the master cylinder. This thingy in the middle is the booster, and it uses engine vacuum to amplify the force that's applied to the brake pedal. Anyway, to restore the function of the power assist brakes, all we need to do is apply vacuum to this port and evacuate all the air out of this section of the booster, and that will effectively charge the booster with a source of energy. So yeah, in this case, we're using vacuum as a source of energy. Anyway, once this chamber is evacuated, the booster is ready to go. Now, on a lot of cars that are in decent condition, this booster can hold a charge of vacuum for weeks, even months. And when you apply pressure to the brake pedal, that's when the vacuum is released. Generally, the booster can hold enough vacuum for about three applications of the brake pedal. After that, the vacuum is depleted. Now, as long as the engine's running, the booster is always connected to a vacuum source, and depleting this chamber of vacuum is never an issue. So on turbo, supercharged, and cars with radical camshafts, the vacuum source can be erratic, and it's possible that the vacuum chamber on the booster won't hold a sufficient charge of vacuum, and the power assist brakes won't work at all, or have limited boost. Now, diesel engines don't produce any vacuum, so this brake booster ain't gonna work unless we give it vacuum from another source. So let's charge the booster with vacuum and verify the booster still works. 
As a quick experiment, we have the pump directly connected to the booster, and before we turn on the pump, let's check the brake pedal. So yeah, the brake pedal is stiff, and that's exactly what to expect if there's no vacuum in the booster. Alright, let's give the pump some power and charge the booster with vacuum. Now this pump is pretty quick for its size, but also keep in mind the booster on this car isn't that large. If this works, it's probably the perfect combination. Let's check that brake pedal. Oh yeah, we have power brakes, so the booster's still functional, and that's good news. Let's check something else. So extremely rapid application of the brake pedal will deplete the vacuum faster than the pump, and that's an issue to be aware of. But the good news is, it only takes a few moments for the pump to catch up. Now this is interesting. The booster on the car doesn't have a check valve, and I know this because I did a little research and the check valve is part of the vacuum hose that was originally on the car. And that vacuum hose is long gone. So it would appear the pump has a check valve of some sort, but I'm not certain it's reliable because when we bench tested the pump, the check valve didn't work. Alright, so this time around we installed the check valve, and now we can run the pump for a few moments and see how the system reacts. Yep, it works exactly as expected. We have power brakes with the pump not running, but we only get three pumps before the vacuum in the booster is depleted. Meh, that's normal. So overall, this stuff seems to work, and now I'm going to go ahead and mount everything so we can test the whole system. The best place for this pump was determined to be on the removable cross brace, so that's where we're going to put it. So this cross brace is thin aluminum, and the best solution is to install some riv nuts. This is a generic low-cost kit that goes by various names on the jungle site. You know, I'm not saying it's good, and I'm not saying it's bad. It seems to work fine for the hobbyist. Anyway, this kit supports eight different types of fasteners, and today we'll be using the M6 fastener. Now, I know the metric crowd is probably cheering in the background, but on this car it makes sense to use metric fasteners occasionally, but not all the time. And besides, I have a ton of M6 rib nuts, and why not use them? This bracket is actually made for some type of Jeep, but it also fits perfect on a first-gen Honda Insight. I'm sure that was the intent all along. Well, maybe not. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and assemble all this stuff, and we can test out the complete system on the car. Okay, the car is back together, and we're ready to do some testing. As you can see, the pump and the other stuff is nicely mounted, and it looks okay. Space is a premium under this hood, and it doesn't look like we used up too much space. I did take a shortcut with the wiring, and before some of you freak out, well, this is just temporary. You see, we're not even done with this project, and I can already tell I want to make some changes. Everything will make sense by the end of the video. Anyway, let's make sure the pump comes on when I press the brake pedal. And, yep, the pump comes on as soon as the vacuum in the booster drops. Perfect! Now, I'm sure you can hear the chattering, and that's a problem. Now, according to the reviews on Amazon, people are blaming the vacuum switch. And, yeah, it's definitely part of the problem. Now, off-camera, I temporarily replaced the vacuum switch with this alternative and more expensive switch, and the chattering is still an issue. Hysteresis is like a $2 word, and that's our problem. Theoretically, we need more of it, but that's not possible by changing the switches. The ideal solution is to have the vacuum pump run for a few seconds longer once the vacuum switch triggers the relay to turn off. Eventually, this chattering is going to damage the vacuum switch and possibly the relay. The good news is, we do have a solution for this, and we'll get to that after the road test. Because at this point, I want to see if this is actually worth the effort. Wow, it's like night and day. The brakes still work the same, but it takes zero effort. I guess the best way to describe it is, before they felt dull, and now the response is sharp. I'm going to say that's good enough for our low speed test. 
All right, let's take this car out for a quick ride and see how the brakes feel out on the open road. Wow, I guess I'm going to have to get used to this feature. Yeah, it's nice. It's almost like driving a real car. You know, this car used to have electric power steering, and I can't imagine why. The steering is very light without power assistance, and, well, that's a feature I'm not going to be restoring. Although I could. You see, EPS was one of my specialties back in the day. So another thing that we're going to be watching on this road test is the engine temperature. In the previous video, we modified the thermostat to see if we can get the engine to run hotter. Today, well, it's 65 degrees out, and it'll be interesting to see if the engine runs any hotter. Alright, let's check them brakes. Nice! I could get used to this. Anyway, back to the thermostat. So on this Kubota D722 engine, the hottest thermostat available is 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I did get a bunch of comments from the previous video from folks suggesting that I should use a hotter thermostat. Well, that's my bad. I should have mentioned that 180 is as hot as you can get. And due to the unusual size, actually this thermostat is tiny. Anyway, there aren't any substitutes. I mean, before I even started messing with the thermostat, I went down the rabbit hole and searched for every possible option, and I'm pretty much stuck with this 180 degree thermostat. Of course, some have suggested that we use an inline thermostat, and I did look into that last year, but there are pros and cons to doing that. First of all, keep in mind everything is tiny on this engine, and a standard size thermostat for something like a small block Chevy would require several hose adopters, and it would get messy real fast. And for now, I'm okay with the mess I currently have. Overall, this little diesel engine gets the job done, but I'm so looking forward to the supercharger experiments. Oh, and by the way, most of the parts to finish the installation of the supercharger have arrived. Now, some folks pointed out that the way I have the supercharger belt routed will cause the belt to fail prematurely, and I need to source a different type of belt that can bend backwards. Well, first of all, thanks for the heads up. Unfortunately, we're going to keep the existing belt for now, and the reason is it's a very narrow belt because everything on this engine is tiny. I think I've said that a few times now. Anyway, a substitute belt that's able to bend backwards is not available. And it's not a big deal. The belt should last long enough for us to figure out how much boost the supercharger is making. And from that point, we can upgrade the belt and the drive pulleys to something that will survive. Yeah, despite the modifications to the thermostat, the engine still tops out at 160 degrees with the radiator partially exposed. That's actually somewhat surprising given how warm it is today. Let's head back to the shop and take a look at some schematics and some possible changes I'd like to make to the electric vacuum assist power brake system. So here's a cartoon of what we built today. It's a simple system that consists of a vacuum pump, a check valve, a vacuum switch, and a 20 amp relay. Let's switch over from this cartoon view to an electrical schematic. So the first thing is, this check valve isn't electrical, so let's remove it from the diagram. Okay, let's get rid of the picture of the pump and replace it with a symbol of an electric motor. And as you can see, we have one side of the motor grounded and the other side is heading towards the relay. All right, let's replace the picture of the relay with an equivalent diagram. There we go. These numbers, 87, 30, 85, and 86, are standard labels for automotive relays. And as you can see, we've attached the hot side of the motor to pin 87. This thingy is, of course, part of the electrical mechanical switch inside the relay, and over here is pin 30. I'm showing a wire coming from a 12-volt power source. Of course, there should be a fuse between the battery and the relay, but I don't show it in the diagram. Now, we need to add one more thing, and that's the ignition switch, and it will be represented by this key. Now, when the ignition switch is turned on, it'll send 12 volts to pin 86 on the relay. Yep, just like that. Okay, let's get rid of the picture of the vacuum switch with something more appropriate, and ta-da! So this is a normally closed switch, and when the vacuum reaches a certain level, the switch will open up and shut off the pump. Hopefully all this makes sense, and if it doesn't, well, I'm afraid you shouldn't be playing with electricity. Anyway, this is how our current system's wired, and I'm not happy with it. 
You see the chattering we heard previously? That's caused by this vacuum switch. Now, that doesn't mean the switch is bad. It means that this circuit is incomplete. What we really need is a time delay relay that'll allow the vacuum pump to run a little bit longer once the switch opens. This will increase the vacuum in the system significantly above the level that the switch triggers at, and that should prevent the chattering. Time delay relays are available, however most of them are time on delay, and we want a time off delay, and those are a lot harder to find, but I did find one, and it was fairly cheap. So I'm sure some folks would say, Jimbo, just put a huge capacitor across the control side of the relay. Well, I hate to say it, but that's more of a hack than a solution. I mean, if you were a professional and submitted an idea like that, people would question your background. Now, a transistor or a FET with an RC circuit, that would give us the time delay that we want, and I could easily gin that up, but we're going for an off-the-shelf solution for simplicity. Now, my second issue with this circuit is the ground switch. Meh, it works, but it limits the way this circuit can be modified. So I'll be replacing the switch with this one. The problem with this switch is it's about twice the price and they generally go between $30 and $50. But it'll simplify the circuit in the end. Now one more thing. On our lightweight project car, the power assist brakes are a luxury and we don't need this feature. And if this switch or the relay fails, well, that would mean we don't have power assist brakes. And as a driver, I can deal with that without breaking a sweat. However, on a vehicle that's a bit more heavier, there should really be a panic switch of some sort that will bypass all this stuff and provide power to the motor directly. You see, in the event of a failure in the control system, the panic switch or bypass switch would supply constant power to the motor and the power assist brakes would be restored. The only real issue with running the pump constantly is, well, it'll wear the pump out a lot faster. Anyway, the road test proved that this simple system works, but I don't trust it because of the way the switch and the relay chatters. So I'll be modifying this system to be more reliable, but I don't have the parts to do that today. If you're interested in how this project turns out, well, in the next episode, and that would be Season 4, Episode 6, I'll post an update. It'll be interesting to see if the improvements are worth all the extra effort. I hope you enjoyed today's mechanical adventure, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Until then.